Hello, everybody. Um, this is by nature of a, a trial for, for us because it's the first time that we're actually using Zoom. So we hope that you'll come back to us and tell us, give us your feedback, uh, not just about the quality of the questions and the answers but about the quality of the transmission uh, and the audio and the video and we will attempt to put it up online afterwards as well so hopefully you can see us all there are four of us here uh, and there are 80 of you meant to be or 81 of you meant to be gathering <laughs> so if i can introduce you from the top left which is judy judy taylor who's waving um, and is on the AQR board. Beneath her is Lisa, Lisa Featherstone, who started all this off because she wrote the book. And to her right is Lynn, Lynn McGregor, who is the current chair of AQR. So what I'd like to do is ask you, Lisa, just to kick us off by telling us how the book came about. Sure. Um, so I, um, I'm not a qualitative researcher and have um, no experience in that field. I'm a journalist. Um, so um, I, um, I was years ago, around 2008, um, looking into um, public opinion around um, our, um, the bailout of our banks during the, at the beginning of the financial crisis um, in the United States, um, which became a worldwide financial crisis to some extent. Um, and um, the, um, the public opinion um, polling was very contradictory and conflicted. Um, it depended how you asked the question. People loved the bank bailout. People hated the bank bailout. They were very, they were, um, you know, very, um, had a lot of different uh, feelings that were only um, superficially measured by, by polling. Um, and, um, and meanwhile, President Obama was coming into office, a more liberal president than we and had had in the United States for many years. Um, and, um, and when I say liberal, I mean um, favor, more favorable to big government. Um, you know, that's, um, that's how I'm using that word here. Um, and so, you know, I was talking with an editor about how it might be a good time for um, a, it might be timely for uh, um, for a book on Americans' relationship to government, which has always been very contradictory and conflicted, um, and then um, that at that time, with a more liberal president coming to office, perhaps we were ready um, to think some more about that. Um, so we thought we were excited about this idea and we did what any um, group of out of touch people do. <laughs> they want to know what the masses think about things. We thought, let's conduct some focus groups. Um, so I, I began to talk to some market researchers that I, I knew um, about focus groups and how I would go about that. And after doing that for a little, and those conversations later became, um, made their way into the book and um, I continued um, interviewing those people. Um, and I, uh, I went back and I said to my editor, um, Colin, focus groups are very, very interesting and strange. <laughs> and he said, I think perhaps that's your book. <laughs> Well, it caused a stir over here. I mean, the first that, that I got from it was emails coming in going, have you read this interview? All of them sort of posing to say that, that the focus group is, is dead or dying, which as we read the book, we suddenly thought, no, actually, she's not saying that. But it, it's a fascinating book in its entirety. Um, so we thought maybe that we'd start it off with um, a look at is it a case of shoot the messenger or disregard the message from the focus group as happened with New Coke when they did all their, their research before, before they launched it? And what's the best way around this to actually ensure that the client gets the right info and you can't ensure that they do anything with it, but understands the implications? Yeah, so, um, so the, the New Coke is a f is fascinating um, to me because it 
it has become the quintessential example that one of those things that everybody knows that is actually not true. Um, that um, at, like everybody knows supposedly um, that um, that the marketing disaster that was New Coke um, is to um, is um, um, was a product um, of focus groups. It's often trotted out as, if you listen to focus groups, you're gonna wind up with um, a product that everyone hates like New Coke. Um, so, um, so that interested me a lot. And, um, and, but what I found um, when I went back into the history um, of the launch of that product um, was interestingly quite um, the opposite. There was, um, there was indeed market research on New Coke, um, but um, it actually completely anticipated the disastrous public reaction to the product. Um, when focus groups were, um, yes, when taste, when people, when people tasted um, the New Coke in taste tests, um, they liked it because it's kind of like Pepsi and people like Pepsi, you know, a little bit better. And um, but when asked in focus groups, how would you feel if um, Coke um, changed its flavor? Um, you know, a number of people said, "Oh yeah, okay, I'd be will, you know, open to it. I'd be willing to try it." A small minority freaked out entirely <laughs> um, and um, and said, "You know, no, this would be terrible. I'd be really upset. They can't tamper with Coke." Um, and um, and that and and, the, and then that minority. Um, swayed the group, um, swayed the groups um, to, uh, so everybody was like, mm, you know, maybe not so much. It's not such a good idea. Let's leave Coke as it is. Well, interestingly, because markets are social, that's exactly what, as we now know, happened to New Coke, that, you know, the vast majority of consumers liked it well enough when they first tried it, but a vocal minority um, really didn't and was very upset. And, um, you know, there were letters to the Coca-Cola company saying, you know, I had only three things sacred in my life, God on the flag and Coke. <laughs> 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 one of them from me. Um, the, <laughs> crisis counselors answering the phone at Coca-Cola and who would say it sounded like someone had died. Um, you know, so, you know, and um, there were grassroots groups organized to bring back old Coke. People had protests uh, with signs. Um, but looking back, all of this was anticipated by the focus group because because that is what is something that focus groups um do rather can do rather well is um is to mirror the group dynamics um that um that we are actually all living in um as consumers so um, so did that message actually get through and they just ignored it it didn't it was it was just disregarded um as happens a lot um, i mean you know that um that a client will do research and um, and sometimes ignore it if it doesn't um you know they were very um they they were very eager to launch this new product for various reasons they thought it would work because um again because people it tasted like pepsi and people do like pepsi and um, they were losing share to pepsi weren't they i mean so yes. that, that was part of the pro problem because there'd been all that pepsi challenge going on and exactly um, and so i think i think that win. that context they were sort of going okay we need to do something exactly. and the blind taste tests were they were the, the real problem you know so yes. doing blind taste tests gave them the wrong the wrong idea because they didn't have the brand as part of the, the sort of exactly. evaluation yeah the taste test couldn't capture um, the um, feelings that people had for Coke, um, but the focus groups could and did. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but uh, but you know they they weren't listened to, and it's um, you know it sometimes it's probably a good idea for the client to weigh other factors than focus <laughs> groups. Obviously, it's not that it's always a bad idea to disregard the focus group, um, and it's not that it's um always. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not always a mistake, but it's certainly very easy for us to say, with all the historical hindsight mm. we have, um, that it was a bad idea to ignore the focus groups. It's something you said, you said in the book um, was that um, people have said, "I've never really been that surprised by anything I've learned in a focus group." Um, yeah. 
one wonders whether that's simply because they've screened out anything that doesn't fit with what they want to hear <laughs> or with what they desire out of that piece of that piece of research which is sort of ratification for their thinking yeah um i actually think that what was meant by that was that um that um, that very often the market research um tells the client and the researchers um what what they already know um in in a useful way you know it's mm. not always you know the simply duplicative it's sometimes you need to find other ways of sure. confirming a hunt. Sure. Um, you know that um but but one of the reasons that um i think that what was also meant by that is that um is that people aren't quite as different as um as as many of us like to believe <laughs> that um that they're not surprised by what they find in a focus group because um, they've because, heard it before <laughs> because you've heard it before because if you've talked to people yeah, you know, yeah. So, um, or you're human yourself <laughs> another way of um another one market researcher said to me and i'm sure this is f a familiar sentiment to a lot of you um how they feel about things is if they're in the de same demographic they all feel the same way yeah, and yeah. so that's another reason to not not always be so surprised by the results then you had a super question i think uh where you talk of the fear of consumer being entwined with fear of women would you like to ask ask that one um, I, I think it's really sort of um, about you know, the, the part in your book where you talk about um, the, the sort of the way that women were treated in focus groups. And I, I know it's going back in time perhaps a little bit, but there was this sort of sense of women were unpredictable, women were emotional, um, and, you know, men in advertising were having real problems with these women that, you know, sort of they, they needed to communicate to. Can you tell us a little bit more about, I suppose, this, um, this the, the, the role of focus groups and women and and what how you see um, I suppose this need for I don't know manipulation maybe as it's, 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 it's a strong word but I think there is a sense in your book that um, focus groups at times move beyond just um, understanding what the consumer wants but are used to manipulate the outcome mm. yeah so the um, in, in mid-century there was such a huge divide between um, the men creating the advertisements and um, and devising the products and making decisions at the corporate level um, and the female consumer. Um, and the consumer was incredibly important because she made most of the household um, decisions around um, around what to buy. So that so that was um, a problem that the that male dominated industry needed to solve how to how to connect with, the, with with these mysterious people, and um, and so a lot of um, um, there and and there was there were a lot of um, often conflicting stereotypes of of women that um, that industry had. Um, you know, women are women were were stupid and um, and and fickle, um, but um, but interestingly, um, industry. Um, would um, would sometimes sound um, more um, progressive in its way of talking mm -hmm. about women than its outside critics. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so when um, so so outside critics um, would would say, you know, women like advertising is terrible because it's manipulating all these stupid women into buying things or or you know these um or you know women who can't control their desires which mm. by which they sort of mean like women are sluts but they um, were always talking about consumer products and um, and so the, you know there was a lot of you know thinking about that um and, and sort of criticizing advertising um, and market research um, on that basis, you know, that are manipulating these 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 crazy creatures. Um, but um, but uh, but often in market research research and advertising's um, defense, when they would defend these methods, um, they would often say, um, "Well, you know, women are actually um, pretty smart." So we ha so we actually have to do a lot of work <laughs> to persuade them <laughs> to buy things, and we have to um, convince them. So the, so that that discourse around the consumer female consumer didn't always mm. go the way you might expect. 
Mm. Because Jay Walter Thompson had had women in quite senior positions in their agency yes. from early, early time, sort of the twenties almost, thirties mm. when they first yes. arrived, yeah. didn't they? And I thought that was really interesting that they yeah. were so progressive at um yeah, well, and, and particularly in research, women were yeah. often placed in these positions because, for, for exactly this reason, because <laughs> they were, um, it was felt that they would better understand the consumer, I mean, and that they would be, you know, that they would be better at listening um, to, the, to these uh, mysterious or fickle or stupid <laughs> consumers. <laughs> <laughs> and or very smart, you know, depending. Um, so, um, so, 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 women were actually um, w women were actually quite um, uh, were researchers um, quite early on, mm -hmm. and by mid century, you see um, um, focus groups and market research um, as um, um, as as a common female profession. Um, you know that, and um, and you see the rise of these um, small um, female owned firms um, even as early as the fifties. You um, talk in the book about um, focus groups being used to fine tune films and ads, and I'm just, I just wondered when I was reading it why, it, it, if that was the case, why it took so long to get to the Me Too movement. Mm. Because I'm, I would have thought there's a, a cause and effect there, but maybe I'm wrong. Mm. Well, I think that there, um, I think, you know, be partly because of all of this listening of that the that the entertainment industry does, um, which um, which you know is is often criticized by um, by creative people as curbing the creative process, and is sometimes consumed um, criticized by consumers as um, you know making making movies more stupid. Which um, you know I think the, I don't think Hollywood needs that much help with that. <laughs> But, but the uh, um, but you know in terms of the responsiveness, um, I think that um, I think that you know in in general in mass media, um, the portrayal of gender roles has been getting more progressive over the last couple decades, and market research probably does have something to do with that. That people will say, oh, like we don't want this woman to um, um, be um, in this silly role. We want her to do something mm -hmm. more powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, and so forth. But as far as um, taking so long to get to the Me Too movement, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, um, I think that in some ways, it's not so much that it's taken so long. We have um, every, every decade or every 15 years or so, um, we do have um, a, a great big um, feminist um, reckoning, or a sort of, femi or sort of an outpouring um, of um, of rebellion um, on gender issues. We in the United States and in Britain, we um, we had this in the '70s, which was the second wave feminist mm -hmm. movement, um, and then um, and then in the in the '90s, um, you know, my um, my not very um, enterprising generation had <laughs> a bit of a feminist movement, um, and um, and you know then you know we we saw throughout um, the um, the the two thousands even we saw a pretty lively um, feminist like blogosphere of of young feminist critics um, on on cultural issues, um, and um, so we always see it. Um, you know, it's it's often latent, and then at times it just really bubbles forth um, because it's an unfinished revolution. So, we I mean, that's what's happening now, I think. There are some very good questions we've got down for politics and democracy, so I don't know which one of you would care to leap in with one or other of those. There was one that I've got in mind, really, which was, uh, I, I suppose, there was a lovely phrase that stood out for me in your book, and it was about, um, we shouldn't just hold opinions, but hold power. And I thought that was a, a lovely sort of you know, turn of the phrase, so if, you know, so if we all talk about people holding opinions and holding power. But I suppose my question to you is, that, is it, you know, it's a, what if people don't want to hold power? What if they just want to have their opinions noted? I mean, is it is it wrong for them to just say, actually, I just want my opinion taken into account? You, why why do you feel so strongly that the, that people need to be standing out and being counted more and and hold more power? 
Yeah, um, so I think that's a great question. Um, so in my book, I describe um, focus groups as being part of the culture of consultation, mm -hmm. um, a, a culture in which we are, have, we are very happy to give our opinions, um, but, um, but where um, the great mass of people don't um, have very much um, political power, don't really um, influence anything very much. Um, and, um, and the thing you've hit on something really important, which is um, that one of the reason that the culture of consultation persists is that we enjoy it. Mm. You know? um, we, um, I mean, over uh, like over the course of the 20th century um, and today, people like to be in focus groups. You know, I mean, it's really um, an enjoyable thing to sit down and you know talk with other people and give your opinion. And you see on the internet, I mean, people love to give their opinion entirely for free. You know, so, so, so the thing is that the, the culture of consultation is very pleasurable. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, um, it's, um, it's true that um, holding power is um, really kind of a pain sometimes. Um, I go, I'm, I'm myself sporadically involved in, you know, local civic um, politics. And, um, and it's really true that um, whenever you win and then have to take responsibility for it and run things, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so, so this is very, um, um, so, so this is very understandable. Um, the reason that I feel so strongly about it is that I, I think that um, the, the kind of, um, I think the kind of society where we're content um, to um, not participate and to just um, give our opinion um, r results in the kind of, um, you know, um, plutocracy in which someone like in my country Donald Trump can become president <laughs> um, you know and um, and, and where, where um, you know I um, acknowledge people may have a range of political opinions in, in, the, in, in our in our audience but um, for for me um, personally that's a society that um, manifestly does not benefit the vast majority of people um, you know and um, and so I, I think in in some sense um, we, we don't want to be um, um, we, we don't want to be merely content with giving our opinion when the stakes are so high um, you know for um, our planet and you know our, our health care and you know a lot of other things that um, that are on, on which our lives really depend but your question is all is interesting because um, one of the things that I, I found when I went into this history was that um, at, at various times, um, qualitative research has been used to think about the question of how, um, how would um, we um, appeal to people um, to, um, to create um, citizens who were actually more equipped um, for things like democracy, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. So, I mean, it, what we've what we very what we very successfully did um, in the mid century um, with uh, with our apparatus of market research and and advertising was to create citizens who were very well suited for consumerism. Mm -hmm. But there were also efforts um, to create um, citizens who were um, who were equipped um, for democracy, and those have so far been less successful. Um, but it would be interesting. Um, it would be interesting if we could uh, work on that. Do you hold uh, focus groups responsible for um, Trump being in power? No, I don't. In fact, <laughs> I mean, in fact he made a big show of. Um, he was asked if he used focus groups, and he said, "He said, I use focus groups right here." <laughs> and in that, he joined a long line of um, of of conservative male leaders um, mm -hmm. who make a big show of how you know they're just too smart to listen to anybody. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so, like, so that's uh, yeah no I, d I don't at all hold focus groups responsible for Trump's presidency, <laughs> but perhaps the the larger culture in which we're content to be heard rather than um, have power.
because you talked about how clever Clinton had been at using the people. Yes. And, and I thought that was really interesting because he was the, the, the president that everybody believed spoke their language. And clearly he'd spent his time listening, 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 and then mimicking. Yes. A lot of the semantics and a lot of the language that people were feeding to him, just straight back at them. Um, yes. The point that they would forgive him all his indelicacies. Um, yes. <laughs> But that was the era, um, you know, I, I did work for um, the Labour Party in Scotland before Tony Blair got in and there were times when you heard the words from focus groups that you had reported on that morning, yeah. speeches yeah. that afternoon and, and, yeah. and it's, it, it was, it was just straight, you know, sort of poured okay. back out into, into their sort of, their speech making. So there was no sort of bit in between where they were going, okay, what does this mean for our policies? It just seemed to go straight from focus groups through to the, the speech writers and, and actually focus that's scary gained quite a lot of status they start you remember the launch of citizens juries mm. which sounds yeah. much grander than focus groups don't yeah you? yeah oh very much so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sit in high office to make decisions mm. on behalf of all of us um mm. about moral codes and, and mm. i thought that was a very interesting inflation of our industry at that mm. time. yeah yeah no longer i don't think no, no, no. Well, I, th I think this. I think they play a subtle role behind the scenes, but perhaps data and analytics is uh, taking it all over. I think it seems like. Yeah. Mm. We've got about f four minutes left oh, before we okay. take questions. If we've got any questions, that is, and I, I, I'm ashamed to admit that I don't know whether we have because I've got full screen. I think I can only see them when I go to a <laughs> split screen. Fingers crossed. Um, so, is there anything that? you two would like to ask Lisa that we haven't asked her as yet. I know that we've got um, looking, but I don't know whether we've covered it, um, a question about in this era, era of fake news and data analytics, why is the focus group so heavily criticised for its role in influencing public opinion? Mm -hmm. But do you reckon we've actually covered that with the previous one? Um, I, I don't know that we have entirely. Um, I, I think that um, I, I think that the um, I mean certainly fake news and Cambridge Analytics are heavily criticised as well, um, and and I, I and I, I think that um, there, there's but I think one of the reasons the focus groups so often come under consideration is that they are people, you know that they're made up of of ordinary citizens mm -hmm. and. Um, and and there and this has often made them a pretty um, convenient scapegoat, you know that um, that you, that um, that when um, when people complain, oh, I don't like this video game. It was it was obviously designed by a focus group. Um, that you know, it's sort of instead of um, you know um, criticizing the um, you know the. Um, you know the, the the companies that needed to make a quick profit by making a like quick and mediocre video game. Um, there, um, it's easier to blame people who are just like yourself. Um, you know, and so I, I think that that's um, a lot of the reason that focus groups have been scapegoated. Um, another reason, really, though, is that um, that um, over. Um, over the last couple decades, especially, um, a lot of the um, a lot of the beating up on focus groups has come from the elites, you know, from um, like from from corporate um, figures um, who are much worshipped, like Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. um, and um, um, from political elites like um, George W. Bush, who famously said, um, I don't govern by focus group, um, although he did. Um, and, um, and um, you know, but those, um, th there's a certain um, contempt that the focus group comes into, uh, uh, in for on the elite side, because um, elites um, in that period, 90s and early 2000s, by that time, had grown so disconnected from the masses and mm. so entitled that the idea that they should listen to anybody, <laughs> you know, besides themselves, um, seemed rather insulting. Um, so, uh, so I think that um, I, I think that some of the criticism of focus groups is 
a bit of trickle down from that elite contempt, but so, and some of it is a bit of self-loathing on our part. Like, <laughs> I have a chapter called, Who Are These Appalling People? Yeah, I love that title. <laughs> love the title. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard people oh. say it's very similar things from behind yeah. the mirror, you know. Yeah. Where did you get these people? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> Uh, Luella, I, don't, I can see a question. Yes, I can see a question oh, too. That, okay. Right, let me see what the question is. Ooh. Sarah Hargaden, I hope yeah, I've pronounced your name right, asks, what are focus groups perfect for? Mm. Um, great question. Um, I, I think actually um, one of the things that focus groups are perfect for um, is looking at um, the group dynamics that the marketplace is sometimes So ironically, the new Coke um, test at launch was actually a, a perfect um, time to use a focus group had they listened. Um, and, um, and I think that that's um, um, one of the early insights um, about focus group was that um, the group dynamics uh, um, were a um, were, were were something valuable that um, that people could learn from. You know that um, it wasn't simply a way to get a bunch of people's um, opinions more efficiently because they were all in one room. That it was actually the um, the dynamics it, it themselves and the way in which people might influence each other um, could, was was actually quite useful. It does seem as if that's almost uh, a situation where it is the, the people that are, are listen the, the, the elites, if you, as you called them in your book, but this, the people in charge of business or the politicians who don't hear what they need to hear. They don't, they, perhaps because they don't want to hear some of what they're being told and they choose to select and, and sort of perceive what they're being told. But often the, the information is there when you look at a little bit deeper, I think, from what you're saying. Right. Do you think that the role of the focus groups will change in the future? I, I mean, it seems to have been evolving over time, a, a wee bit anyway. Yeah. What, what do you predict? Well, um, so one of the things, I, at the end of my book, I talk about the, um, the phenomenon of, of declaring the death of the focus group. Like this is like every every couple of years, um, when I looked at the sort of media coverage of, of this, every couple of years um, the focus group will be declared dead um, because of some new method, you know, crowdsourcing or you know something like that. Um, and and now Cambridge Analytica data mining um, and. Um, um, you know, t um, ten years ago it was uh, social media um, itself. Um, and um, and and it it never seems to die any like the, like the it always seems to the method seems always seems to outlive these eulogies um, and so um so, so I think um, that's interesting and suggests that there um, there will um, there I think there will for this foreseeable future be some need um, to hear from people in person to see the kinds of in-person group dynamics um, um, that can arise from a discussion, to read people's body language, uh, um, which you know, can often say even more than their words. Um, and um, so, um, so I, I mean, I'm always, I'm not so good at predictions. I didn't predict that Trump was gonna be president. <laughs> um, but, um, but I would guess that, that, that there will continue to be a role for it. I do think, um, it's undeniably true that for, um, especially for startups and other, um, you know, other, other small enterprises, um, these kinds of data mining um, methods um, are, are cheaper and more efficient. Um, you know, so, um, so, so I, th I think like on, you know, when you look at that, um, at that sector, um, it's, you know, I think they're, they're, they're going to be um, um, much more dependent on this kind of anonymous data. I, I wondered what you thought about the sort of evolution of focus groups as well. There is a lot more done now using the client in the room with the respondents and, you know, throughout the book, you talk about the mirror mm -hmm. um, and what clients think of these other creatures who are actually them just mm -hmm. leading their lives. Um, yeah. 
now there's much more collaboration, um, which, you know, exists across generations. So you can have a 25 year old sitting with a 55 year old, he can be an entrepreneur, the 55 year old can be a head of business, and they can share ideas and collaborate together in a way we didn't really conceive of in the 90s. Um, I don't know what you think about that, or whether you looked at any of that for your book. Um, yeah, I, I think that that is interesting. And in general, um, I think that um, I, I think that um, the you know when companies say, "Oh, we don't use focus groups," um, what they often mean um, is that they actually do something that is um, more horizontal. You know that that involves listening to people in a way that they find more effective. Well, you know, adult, so. adult, really, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, what? Oh, more adult to adult. Um, yes, exactly. More, yeah, more, more egalitarian or more yeah. horizontal, yeah. Um, and um, and you know, so um, so for example, it was you know, it was always very famously touted that um, you know Steve Jobs as Apple didn't use focus groups, mm. um, and but if you look at what their um, what their model was, they were um, th um, there was there was so much. Um, input and discussion um, among within the company um, and so much consideration of themselves as users that uh, you know that essentially they were designing products for themselves that they thought that they would like and because the end and they correctly identified that the consumer the consumers they were targeting would be very much like them you know and and so so, so it was sort of a it, it wasn't it wasn't at all that it was all about one man's big genius. I mean, it was it was simply that they had found um, a different um, a different and possibly even more participatory way of involving the consumer. Yeah, interesting. I think we've probably come to an end. Unless any of you lot out there fancy asking another question, I think what I will do is thank Lisa very much for this our, our first session on Zoom. And uh, thank. God, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been very scared. So thank you, one and all. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank oh, you. it was a total pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, and I hope it will have recorded. Oh, oh, somebody actually has come up on. Oh, oh. Richard Gash, bless his cotton socks, says it's been a brilliant process and a great conversation. Oh. Um, thank, so, you, thank you, Richard. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Right, I will end the meeting and stop the recording. Thank you one and all. Bye. 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 Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Bye. Bye.